Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by Whole Foods Market, a dynamic leader in the quality food business, a mission-driven company that aims to set the standards of excellence for food retailers. For more information, visit WholeFoodsMarket.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit HeritageRadioNetwork.org for thousands more. Welcome to Chef's Story. This is Dorothy Can Hamilton from the International Culinary Center, and I'm here at Roberta's in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And today, I have one of the most extraordinary chefs in the world, and probably this is um, the chef who's come the farthest to Brooklyn <laughs> that we've interviewed. Francis Malman is a chef from Argentina, but he is renowned through all of South America. Uh, and w- probably one of the best-known properties that he has is in Uruguay, Garzón, which the New York Times said was worth one of the top ten restaurants in the world, worth the plane ride and all the way to Uruguay. So I am just so excited because I discovered um, Francis uh through his book, Seven Fires. And if you don't have it, you have to go get it. I read it and fell in love. I fell in love with your properties and your whole philosophy. Welcome, Francis. This is a true thrill for me to have you here today. Well, thank you very much, Dorothy. I'm I'm, I'm honored to be here. Oh, my gosh. You're you're one of the superstars of South America. Um, And I think uh, I want to get into this. You're your background, what actually turned you on to food, and where where did you really um, get this love of uh, your special your specialty in, in cooking? So we're going to get right into it. So where did you grow up? Was it Argentina? Yes. <clears throat> I grew up as a young, young boy. We lived in Chicago with my family, and then we moved to Patagonia when I was about five. So were you born in the States? No, I was born in Argentina and then moved here. Uh-huh. So I went to sort of kindergarten here. That's why your English is so incredible. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, thank seriously. you. And then after that, when I was about five, six, we moved to Patagonia, to a little town in Patagonia in the lakes district, very beautiful place. Why did your parents go to <clears throat> Patagonia? Well, my father is a physicist. Oh. So he was working in an atomic center in Chicago mm. at that, at, in, the, in the 50s. Mm. And then he moved to an atomic center in... Patagonia. <laughs> what a place. Chicago, Patagonia. Yeah, how, very how did a six-year-old see the difference? Well, um, you know, I have the most beautiful um, r- souvenirs of Chicago, the fields. We, we were not in the city. We were living in a little town. I remember the, all the wheat fields, the corn. Uh, I remember going to school. Uh, I remember this frozen river in the winter. It was very beautiful. And from there, we went to Patagonia, which, you know, it's a bit of the same climate, <clears throat> except you have the big mountains, the Andes, all the lakes, uh, and all the, the wilderness that touched me forever. And that really inspired my, my life, and it's sort of a, a refugio, a refugee in my, in my thoughts when, I, when, I, you know, when I'm sort of in an adverse moment, I always think and dream of Patagonia. Mm. 
So how long were you there? I was there uh, in and out until I was around 16. Oh, for 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. So I, I, w I went to my sort of my school there. Uh, and then, <clears throat> you know, in 1969, I was touched by this uh, music thing that happened, as you know. And I became a, sort of a, a hippie. And I decided that I didn't like school. I dropped school at 13. I left home because my parents were very angry with me. Mm. And at 16, I moved to San Francisco <laughs> following... <laughs> this the is hate Ashbury days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, mean, I, was, I was staying in... A, I remember staying for a long time in an ashram in San Jose. And I moved around California following all the musicians I loved then. Who did you love? Then? Oh, God, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Oh. Uh, obviously, Bob Dylan, that sometimes we were happy enough to hear in Santa Barbara in a little place called the Bluebird Cafe. So all that influenced me a lot, <clears throat> music. And when I was around almost 18, I went back home after two years in California, and I decided that I had to work. And since I had lived on my own, you know, since I was 13, I knew how to cook things for my friends, and they always said, oh, Francis is going to cook. And so I opened a little restaurant very, very fast with a friend of mine who was English, and she had studied the Cordeau Bleu in France. And <clears throat> she helped me, she trained me a bit. And when I was 22, I realized that I really loved that so much, that, and I moved to France. Oh. I did several trips between 18 and 22 to Paris mm -hmm. to feel what was happening. And at 22, I just wrote to all the three stars restaurants, that there were 21 then, saying that I wanted to learn, and most of them said yes. So I just moved there and worked uh, during almost four years in some of the best restaurants of the times. Mm -hmm. This was 1970. So who did you work for? <clears throat> I worked for Roger Berger in mm -hmm. Le Moulin des Mougins. Mm -hmm. I worked in Paris at the Grand Befour with Raymond Oliver. Mm -hmm. I worked at Taille Vente with Jean-Claude Brina. Uh, I worked at Les Doyennes at the Champs-Élysées. Mm. I worked with Alain Chapelle oh my in Lyonnais, near Lyon. I worked with the Troagro brothers in oh Rouen. <laughs> yeah. And I'm missing one. And I worked with Alain Sanderans at L'Arquestrat in, in Rue de Varennes. So you had Paris, outside <clears throat> of Paris, yes. south of France. Yes, I had so. a bicycle. I was so... I remember my first day in the kitchen was at Les Doyennes. Uh, and after being a Patagonian boy, I walked into that kitchen with 60 chefs dressed for the first time with a hat, all in white, and I had to hold myself to the wall because I, I, I was so, you know, I was so happy and impressed with everything and the way they worked, and it, it was a wonderful experience. France was very generous with me and as well very uh, rigorous with me. You know how French Tell cooking is. Tell us about is. the rigor. Tell, you have any great stories from... <clears throat> well, many great stories. My first day at Les Doyennes, <clears throat> I remember they gave me probably 10 cases of artichokes to, to, to clean, to make, you know, the, the, the fond d'artichaut. And uh, I was there so afraid doing these artichokes for hours, and suddenly everybody was laughing and looking at me, and... I looked down into my feet, and they had painted my shoes in white, and that was sort of the <laughs> that was sort of the welcome thing. So, uh, but you know, as I said, France was was very generous with me. Oh, so you were there for two, almost for four, four years. Four years, <clears throat> in yeah. and out. Yes, four years. There was no other place in the world at that stage if you wanted to do fine dining, was there? Well, if you look into the history, it's quite beautiful, the history of French cooking, obviously. But what happened was that in the 1950s, there was a restaurant in a town near uh, Lyon called Bienne, which was La Pyramide, or mm -hmm. Point. Mm -hmm. And in the 50s, there was a group of about 12 chefs who were working there as trainees. They were mm -hmm. 13, 14. And who were they? They were Roger Berger, Paul Bocuse, the Troigros, Raymond Thuyer from the Story of Manière. And there's a beautiful book which is called Crocombouche, which tells this story. And what happened is when, when these boys were 20, after training with Fernand Point for so many years, they went back to their home restaurants and they created this uh, movement, many of them, which was called La Nouvelle Cuisine, which was in the 70s. 
And so it was, it was the first time that chefs were the owners of restaurants. This mm. term that the French use, the chef patron. Mm -hmm. no? And that changed completely the scene of France. Because before that, you had all these wonderful chefs, but they were not the owners of the places. And in, 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 So in the 1970s, this thing started where these boys who had trained with this incredible chef, which was Fernand Point, who started with all these ideas of, of, more, of cooking things less, of doing fresh products, of using obviously lots of cream and butter as they do. But he trained all these boys, and when they, when they knew their trade, they sort of opened up, going back to the little home hotels of their parents, you know, where they had little cafes, and they went with their, this, these dreams they had learned, and they started this revolution in France, which was at its peak in 1978, 1979, when I arrived. So I, I, I was very, very lucky to, to work with many of them and feel that. So what was going on in your palate at that time? Were you adopting the new French flavors and tastes, or were you thinking of the ingredients back home and playing in your mind um, with these new techniques that you're learning? I was just so... I couldn't speak of what I was seeing. I mean, after working in Patagonia for two or three years in a tiny restaurant, you know, the, the bridge was so, so... The, the difference of the two things I, I had done in the past and this new thing was so huge that it... I was just, uh, you know, hypnotized by all this. So, How did you know to go to Paris? Were there a lot of young uh, Argentinians that went off to Paris? Was it the thing to do if you were going to be a cook? Well, when I started cooking, the truth is I started cooking with two books. The La Rousse Gastronomique, which was <laughs> obviously in French. My French was quite poor at that time. And the Mastering the Art of French Cooking of Julia Child and really? Simone Beck. Oh, yes. did you get that when you were in Chicago or, I, no, or I, no, in no, California? No, 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 later, later. I got that when I started cooking. And that really and I, helped you, huh? Oh, that helped me so much. So, you know, both of them had very strong French influence. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book of, of Julia Child was so perfect. I mean, I remember doing at my restaurant at age 19, the Timbal Elysee, which is this incredible dessert done of... of, of, of of, of pastry and, and this sort of case of sugar. And, and all the, work, the recipes worked uh, perfect. And later on in my life, and I think it was in 1997, I, was, I cooked for Julia Child in Miami once in a big party, and it was so nice to talk to her, and, to, and she tasted my food, and I told her in a microphone in front of everybody that I, was, I had started with her heart. Oh, yeah. She was such a gracious woman. Yeah, oh, yeah, my yeah, gosh. Yeah. I'm and so I, I remember saying some sexy things about my menu, and she loved that, too. <laughs> she I loves said, sex. Oh, yeah, I yeah, have yeah, to yeah, tell yeah. her, really. I said, I said you, know, you know, this wine you're going to taste is like, I, don't, I, I, I said very sexy things. And she laughed, and she, yeah, she, she yeah. was very nice. Yeah, she was, <laughs> she was a great woman. So, uh, so uh, back down to uh, now, you've finished uh, your four years in France, where you where did you go from there? From there, I went back to Buenos Aires. I, one day, I was living in Paris. Uh, my first wife was expecting my first child, and we got a telegram. You remember there was the times of telegrams then? Mm -hmm. They don't exist anymore, I think. Mm -hmm. Under the door, a man said, eh, I need you as a chef in Buenos Aires. At that time, incredibly, I was uh, working a job at the World Trade Center uh, in a restaurant up there. This was 1980. Oh, was that cellar in the sky yeah, or what, windows, windows on the world? Windows, windows on the world. World is on the world. So, but, you know, since I, we decided to go back to Argentina. And then I, I went into a period of cooking uh, for somebody else in a very fancy restaurant. Uh, quite horribly, I think. A uh, very arrogant French food. Old-fashioned? No, I, you know, I was trying to copy exactly what I had learned in France. And mm -hmm. I don't think I was achieving it really because of products and because... You know, it's that, you know, when, when you admire chefs a lot, even for, I think it's the same thing with painters or musicians, you just try to copy things, mm -hmm. you know, especially if you're very young. Mm -hmm. And I think I didn't achieve very much in that period of my life. You know, I was trying very hard, working, but uh, I, 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 I don't think uh, I was doing it very well. And, Do you, know, you think a young, sh a young chef can think their own way through, or do you have to go through a period where you copy? Well, if you have a passion in life for something like cooking, eh, there's no way you don't copy. I mean, you, you admire people, you admire 
languages in cooking, you admire chefs, and you know, and you want to do that. So it, it takes quite a while in the life of a chef to find your own language. Um, you know, How long do you think it takes? I think it takes 20 years of cooking to find your own, really your own language. Or, you know, um, maybe you can achieve it at fi 15 years of cooking, maybe at 12, but I don't think anything shorter than that. You know, cooking is a craft. You need all the technical parts. You need to to understand the roots of what you're doing, and you have to find your way. And in order to find your way, you have to have chopped millions of onions, and you have to be have been standing in front of a pan, you know, thousands of times, looking at the same operation. And that there's a silent language in cooking that you can't read in a book, that nobody can teach you, that you only earn, learn by chopping and standing in front of a fire or, a, you know, or, or a pot. And uh, that silent language is our language, and there's no way n anybody can explain it or teach it to you. The only way you can learn it is by the action of doing things and repeating things hundreds and thousands of times. Wow. Okay, we have to take a break here. We're going to come back, and we're going to find out how you manifested that. Today's program has been brought to you by Whole Foods Market. Washed rind cheeses are a fairly recent addition to the repertoires of artisanal cheesemakers in the United States. These cheeses tend to be stinkier than other types and are often high on the list of connoisseurs. Now, Whole Foods Market has come up with one of their own. The raw cow's milk cheese made by Sprout Creek Farm in Poughkeepsie, New York, is washed with six-point ale from Red Hook, Brooklyn. The beige sticky rind deepens in color as it ages. The satiny ivory cheese within is mellow with a sweetly tangy bite and a grassy aroma. The current version features six-point diesel, which is in limited supply, so stop by and pick up some before it's gone. And point-of-origin cheese is sold exclusively at Whole Foods Market in New York, northern New Jersey, and Connecticut. For more information, visit WholeFoodsMarket.com. Well, welcome back. You're listening to Chef's Story, and I'm Dorothy Can Hamilton. And today, my guest is the great Argentinian chef, Francis Malmont. And, you know, he's probably best known for his, you know, grilling techniques and, and just extraordinary uh, use of wood fires, which we're going to get into uh, right now. Francis, tell me, tell me about... Um, your restaurants in South America and what you try, what you try to do. I, I don't think you can do them here unless you're in Montana. It's, it yeah. strikes me well, that you're well, a very well, big, big canvas chef. Yes, you know people think about fire as a as a powerful and very maybe male thing, you know, but fire for cooking it, it's an extremely fragile thing. It has a very feminine side, you know, because obviously. You can have the, the power of a, of a huge flame on a chapa where you're going to burn something. But as well, it's a language where you have to be very careful. And the beauty about cooking with fire is, is patience. And the beauty of it is reading what's happening with your fires, your coals, you know, it, and then trying to get that heat to what you're cooking in exactly the way you want. So... You know, the other night I was cooking in the street in, at Gramercy Park, and people would say, well, it was huge fires, a lot of heat. But And I, and I, and I was saying to them exactly that, you know. Cooking with fires, it, it's very feminine. It's very fragile. It, it needs a lot of, of touch, of, of thought. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful and very tender language. How did you make the, the jump from the fine French haute cuisine <laughs> to this <coughs> huge... You yeah. Know, well, you fires. know, it, the truth is, I'm 56 now, and the change came when I was 40. At 40, I received this incredible prize in Paris where they gave me the Grand Prix de l'Art de la Cuisine, which is something they give once a year to one chef in the world. And that prize made me think, you know. I, it made me very happy, obviously, but it made me very sad, too, because I realized I had gone a long way. I had got that prize that many of the chefs for whom I had worked when I was 18 or 20, you know, had, they had it too. And so I said, well, God, what, what am I doing? 
So I decided that I wanted to find a language. I was already very attracted to the roots of Argentina and all the, the cooking of all the, the original people, you know, all the, the Indians from, from the south, and looking at what they were doing. So I created this sort of thought of seven fires, which are seven techniques of cooking with fires. They are related to the Andes, to the Pampas, and to, you know, the fields of Argentina and Uruguay and Brazil. Language is a very big thing in our country, and we do it in many different ways. And the seven techniques are cooking in a chapa, you know, in, in a griddle, in a big griddle with fire, cooking in, in ashes, which we call rescoldo, which where you cook directly something on ashes or a fish or a vegetable, curanto, which is cooking in a pit with hot stones and covering it with earth, in a wood oven, which is a technique that you was used a lot by the Incas as well in the Andes, in the grill, as you know, like a barbecue here, and then you have as well, I'm missing one, which is the asador, which is cooking on a on a stick or mm. on a yeah on a cross iron on a whole animal or a fish or something. So I started working with that and getting all these techniques into my restaurants, you know. And <clears throat> that, and I, 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 I was very happy because I, for in a way, it was like going back to my childhood, remain, remembering all those camping days, all those days walking in the mountains as children. We had all these incredible German teachers of mountaineering when we were young, and all that came back to me. And I decided to take those tools and to make them into my language of cooking, which made me extremely happy. But I, I was lucky enough to have all that strong roots and foundations of my French cooking days, which, you know, even though if I present you a, a, um, a plate of, you know, burnt beets and uh, burnt uh, butternut squash or, and, a, and, a, and a fish done at El Infiernillo, as I did the other night at the Gramercy Tavern, it, you will say, well, this is not French, but, but believe me that France is so, so strong still in my cooking. You can't see it. I'm not doing a Bernays sauce, you know. I'm not doing a pot of feu. I'm not doing a, a, a cassoulet. <clears throat> but those, the, that training on France is, is still in my cooking. It's very strong. It was the best tools I, 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 I so ever got. Let me ask you. So you, you went back to Argentina, and there are all these traditional methods of cooking with open fire. or And was anybody doing it to the level that you, you envisioned in your in your mind it, was it you were fascinated with fire and you wanted to well no we were no to one was it all the different forms of it or how did it all come about or is that a typical way in Argentina yeah well it's it's a, it's the language of, of of the pampas of the andes but not of fine chefs no 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 but it's a it's a most elegant and beautiful language you know if you look into the life of the gaucho which is our our cowboy you know he wakes up in patagonia at 6 a.m., he puts a fire out outside, he makes his mate, which is the tea we eat, and he will, and he will grill some lamb for breakfast. And then, he, since he has some nice ashes and some coals left, he's going to put some things and bury them in the, in, the, in the ashes and coals to be cooked while he works. And then he comes back and he has, you know, cooked food. And so... The truth is, I didn't invent anything, you know. I just took all these beautiful languages of cooking of my country and of the original uh, inhabitants of Argentina 15,000 years ago and I, tried to, I, and I started to change little things, the times of cooking things, improving things in the way I could but basically using... Can you, can you walk us through one of those things? Well, for example, chimichurri. Chimichurri is, is the most popular sauce in Argentina which is, you know, it's a sauce done with vinegar, brine, oregano, parsley, garlic, um, chili flakes, and oil, not olive oil. So, and they, obviously the gaucho takes this in a bottle in his horse because, you know, he stops and he, he cooks with that to get taste to meat. So I improved it by, you know, nothing too difficult, putting olive oil into it, using a very good red wine vinegar, <clears throat> Uh, using fresh oregano and fresh parsley, they they don't, uh, you know, they they use dry herbs because that's what they have, and using the very best chili flakes, 
And so that's a, a simple example of how things can still be improved in many recipes, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I did, really. I started, you know, looking into these languages of cooking and, and trying to improve all the things that were already written in, in our bones, really, for, 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 for hundreds of years. What was the first thing you did um, in this style that you said, yes, this is where, you know, I'm going to continue down this path? Well, I think that the... the I realized, you know, that um, that cooking simple, you know, simple things is the most difficult thing. You know, when you go to a restaurant and you get a, a fish which is which has a sauce on it, and then on the side you have four or five different vegetables and little things here and little herbs. I think it's very suspicious. I don't want to eat that. But if you go to a restaurant where you get a you know a plain white piece of grilled fish or steamed and a little olive oil, a little salt, and a burnt tomato, and a, and, a, and a boiled potato. God, that fish has to be very fresh. The olive oil has to be very good. It has to be sprinkled with the best sea salt in the world. The potato has to be good and nicely cooked to perfection. And the tomato has to be perfectly charred and not completely burnt, but not pale and sad. So it's, that is very difficult to achieve. It's very easy to use sauces and confuse people with hundreds of things in the plates and to use all these spices. And, you know, I think it's confusing. I don't like that food. But if you do... It tells, I think you like burning, though. I love burning. Tell me about burning, because <laughs> when I burn, I burn. It doesn't yeah, taste well, very good. Yeah. So tell me how you burn. Well, I call it the uncertain edge of burnt. Oh, okay. So, it's uncertain because... In order to burn something, for example, let's, let's talk about a squash, a uh, butternut squash that burns so beautifully. So if you have a, a, a piece of butternut squash that you're going to burn on a plancha, uh, and let's say it has a, an inch thick flesh, this butternut squash, if you char just 10% of it, you know, on one side, really black, it's a, and, and you have a big piece, and then you cook it through in a slower food, a slower way, but it's, it's nicely cooked, caramelized. It's beautiful because the mix of that 10% burnt with 19% of flesh, it's perfect. But if you, burn, if you burn it all the way through, it's horrible. So, you know, that's why I say this thing about the uncertain edge of burnt. And it had some things. So, bur caramelization of getting brown is yeah. sweet. Yeah. But burn is bitter. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, depending okay. on what. So, really, so tell me the differences in well, the different some kinds things of burn. Well, some things burn a, almost always sweet, like an onion, like a carrot. You know, if mm -hmm. you go all the way through to burning it, yes, it is bitter. Mm -hmm. Like a tomato, you know, a burnt tomato is beautiful. 10% um, burn. 10% of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have to have all that. And I like, I like to cook things where... You know, you have this mix of, of, of the two things, of the fleshy, nice, tender, uh, whatever you're cooking, and then this very burnt thing. And the mix of it, it's wonderful. And what I, I love smashing things, too. So when I burn something, you know, for example, if, if, if this would be the, the, the butternut squash and it's burnt, I like to smash it with my hands like that and break it up so... You see that the, the you you see part of the burnt and the beautiful flesh and uh, so it's not that you're seeing something completely black. How does salt play with burn? So well, so, salt it is very important, you know. But I, I'm 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 really against marinating things, you know. And this means that I don't like salting things way ahead either, you know. I, I like to salt things generally only on one side. For example, a chicken or a meat, if I'm going to cook it in a grill or in a, in a chapa, in a griddle, I, I only put salt in the last moment before cooking on one side, on, on the first side that's going to go down. Mm -hmm. I like it because I don't believe in harmony in food. I like, I like dissonance. I, I really don't believe. I think that our harmony when, when we eat is for when we are babies. You know, we like nice tastes and this sort of uh, cradle songs when we eat. But when we grow up, I think we need dissonance. And so if you have a very salty everything when you eat, I think it's not nice. I think it's nice to have one part of it 
extremely salty and nice, and then you can mix it up with all the rest. And then obviously the, the guests can add salt and pepper if they want more, but that's very important in my cooking. It's dissonance. I really, I, hear, I hate these pairing wine things. I think it's just... I don't know. It's, okay, it, it, we're going to come right back to this. We've got to take another break, but we're horrible. going back there. Wine pairing is the most horrible there. thing. Okay, we'll be right back. Like what you hear so far? Support the network and become a member. Membership helps us bring you the best food radio in the world and gives you access to thousands of dollars in discounts at the sustainably minded businesses that support us. To become a member, visit heritageradionetwork.org today. Welcome back. You're listening to Chef's Story, and I'm Dorothy Can Hamilton. And today, my uh, guest is the great chef... Um, from Argentina, who actually spent his first six years in Chicago, Francis Malmon. And I have to tell you that uh, if you have, if you if you can get seven fires grilling the Argentine way, and was uh, in two thousand and nine came out, it was a Beard Award winner. Uh, you you have to you you just have to get your hands on it because then it, everything will come in context here. So uh, we were just talking about burning food and how delicious that makes it and dissonance which i've never heard a chef talk about before and you were saying you don't like food and wine pairings let's uh yes well tell me about that well you know suddenly the world has become used to all these sort of very young sommeliers who after studying two years and tasting a couple of bottles of wines they feel the right to use all these pretentious adjectives to talk about wine. And I told you a while ago that learning to be a chef takes 15, 20 years. I think that learning to drink wine takes 40. I mean, it's such a subtle and beautiful thing. I'm glad to hear you say that because I'm still learning. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> I, really, you know, I think you, I'm you, on you, my 40th year yeah, of doing yeah, it Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> it takes a long time. So suddenly, you know, the market, a uh, marketing tool was to talk about, you know, uh, wine pairings and, you know, the, the using 15 different adjectives to talk about uh, a wine and i think it's nonsense nick tosh an incredible i think american writer wrote a, a very nice paragraph in one of his books where he's he talks about this in a very nice way and so i really don't believe that i i believe that when you eat and drink you want to have some excellent food you know very very good tasty nicely done with respect for the product, respect for the cooking time, and so on. And you want to have a very good wine that has nothing to do with it, that it completely clashes in your mouth, both of them. You want them to clash. That's, that's what I want when I eat myself. Now, this is a personal opinion. So, why? Because both of them will be very good. There is a clash in your mouth. Both of them will try to convince you I'm the best, you know. But, you know... Having a perfect, you know, obviously, for example, if you eat a nice steak with, with a red wine, with a good red wine, yeah, it's perfect. But it's so boring. Mm. It's boring, you know, because it's so harmonious that, you know, it, I, I think it takes you nowhere. I'd rather have, for example, a very nice, elegant white fish like a striped bass from Long Island with an incredible strong red wine, you know, instead of a, a, a sort of a harmonious white with it. Because I, I really believe that that gives you more happiness when you eat. You know, that clash of... of and it, ha- it happens the same thing with temperatures when you eat, you know, and consistencies. For example, the most beautiful soup, perfectly done, s- spoon after spoon, it's very boring. But if you have something crackling in your mouth like a crust of bread or some crackers or something with the soup, that brings interest to it and it makes you keeps you thinking, you know. All right, can I can I maybe argue a little here? Certainly. I I'm thinking in my mind maybe having a ceviche or no, just a crudo of a very subtle fish. 
and then drinking a big tannic wine. Yeah, and perfect. the tannin, I don't think so, because the tannins, you know, they, they uh, pucker and coat your, your mouth. Yeah. And, well, and the subtlety that you have to, you know, in the silkiness of a, a crudo, I think is, is lost. And so they fight each other. I'm not talking about having a perfect marriage. I don't think there is such a thing. Yeah. But <laughs> I, do don't, I don't like to fight all the time. Yeah. And so I think there are things that fight each other. And, and it's, not just food, uh, it's not just food and wine. I think it's food on the plate. And and one of my my questions for you, getting back to the the grilling, is um, you do whole animals like whole cows. I've seen those pictures mm. on the sticks. Yeah. Um, do you have a, a preference? Is there one way that makes cow taste better? Is you know is a steak or a, a grilling whole animal versus part animal? Well, as I said at the very beginning. Uh, Cooking with fire is an extremely fragile thing, and it, it, you have to be very careful. And this, this is really important when you cook a whole animal. It can be a lamb, a goat, or a whole cow. You have to do it extremely slowly. We cook a whole cow probably in 18, 19, 20 hours. We roast it very, very slowly, so it gets, it, it, it's still very tender. And the, the worst enemy you have when you do a big animal like that is the wind. You really want to be on a windless day. Because the wind makes the cold hot and cold, hot and cold, and it destroys its quality because the muscle becomes very hard. So wind is very bad. <clears throat> but now going back to the wine thing, there are certain enemies like artichokes and asparagus are impossible to pair with, with anything because mm. it's just when you drink mm. a white you know, a white wine or a red wine, it just don't work. But in, in the other things, I, I, still, I still like that clash in my mouth. But, you know, it's a very personal thing. I, I don't say, you know, I'm, I'm right. I this actually like Sancerre with asparagus. Yeah, well, Sancerre can do or champagne. Because of the acidity, yeah. you know, I yeah. think that's where I would call it harmony, that there are elements to a wine in your mouth, you know, uh, that actually... Con- not compliment, but work with the food. And the, yeah, so works. this is a very. So what do you like to what do you like to drink with your big animal meats? What I mostly like are, are, are sort of old, elegant, thin wines. You know, I I really uh, I mean we have these huge malbecs in Argentina, which are red, like 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 a juice of fruits, sweet, uh, full of sun. They're beautiful, but they're very boring. You know, I, I'm, I'm always telling the winemakers, you know, when, when, are we, when, when are we going to go back to, you know, more subtle, elegant wines that we age more, you know? Mm. The, the world is getting ready to drink wines immediately, mm. and we're forgetting about the aging process which brings all this elegance and aftertastes in wine. So if you ask me, I certainly like old, thin wines. Uh, that's what I most like. So what's exciting you these days? What is exciting on what? What what what's what turns your head these days about food or you know um, and and cooking? Is there how how do you get inspiration? Well, you know, I'm working on a new book now, for example, and I'm I, I was shooting photographs this morning. I have four of my chefs here, and we're cooking with fires in the street. And what I did was I went around all the best markets of New York. I had I I never have a plan. And I bought wonderful fishes and meats and vegetables and, and things. And I, I, I took all these baskets to, to the site. I, I opened my tables. I got my fire working, going. And I looked at them and I said, God, look at what a beautiful... So, and, 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 and there I decide what to do. Inspiration has to do with the last moment thing, you know, that, that idea. I think that it, you, know, you can make a list to go to the market if you need salt, sugar, flour, olive oil, and vinegar. But to write down Arctic chokes or asparagus or fish, I think you can't. I think that, you know, and Paul Bocuse said this in his 1976 book, La Cuisine du Marché, The Cooking of the Market. He said, never make a list. Walk around the market for half an hour first. Look at everything. And then buy whatever you think is the best and what inspires you. And then you get back home and you make a menu. But you, you, you can't make a menu at home. 
You know, you don't want to make a menu at home. You want so to are you a- making menus on the street? Yes, I'm making menus is on the street. The, is that the, you know, the book you, you're writing look, you is know, menus on the street? But this morning, you know, yeah. I, was, I, I was cooking at, at the terrace of the River Cafe under the Brooklyn Bridge. And we opened these two beautiful tables and I had meats, fishes, the most incredible herbs. And I looked at them and I said, I'm going to match this with this. I'm going to burn this with that. And that's how and that's the way I do my books always. You know, I, I, I never have a plan. And the editors go crazy and they say, well, what is the plan? Send me the 100 recipes. And I have no idea. I have no idea. And, and that's the beauty about cooking. You know, I really believe that cooking is getting home, opening your fridge and looking into a maybe an old piece of chicken of two days ago, some white rice that has been cooked and some, you know, green onions and, and, and doing something beautiful with that in 20 minutes. That's the truth about cooking. You know, it's so you, you, you can't have a list of, of foie gras, caviar and lobsters. You can, but the beauty about cooking and the reality about cooking is getting home and doing something nice in, in you know, in half an hour that makes you happy. That, that, that's cooking for me. We have a lot of young chefs out there listening to this program and... Um what would you say to them is the most important thing for them to pursue in their career? I think that the most important thing, thing is to be respectful. Be respectful with history. Be respectful with the roots of the different ethnic cookings and not get dizzy and tempted by you know all these ideas that you can grab and steal from books and internet. You know... You really need roots. You really need to learn and know about classic cooking. You know, I see all these young chefs in, at home that they go to school. After three years of studies, they want to be doing molecular cooking right away. And they, they don't know really what, what the history of Italy or France or Spain or whatever is. And they, they want to jump immediately into that. So I think that's one of the dangers. And I think that I, I'm... I'm I, I really respect that. And, you know, the other thing, you know, for a young chef is that, you know, they just go for two weeks to Vietnam. They walk around the markets. They buy a couple of books. They get home and they open a Vietnamese restaurant. That's so unrespectful. You know, you have to live in that country for years before you can do it. Maybe you can achieve a couple of tastes. Maybe you will achieve things. But it's it's hollow. You know, you can't you, you can't say you God, I'm embracing this. I'm using this language because I know the depth of this, of it, you know. So I think, you know, the, I did all those, mis- those mistakes, you know, as, as a young chef, you do them. But you, you have to be, you have to have a lot of respect. Authenticity. For, yeah, yeah. For the authentic yeah. cuisine. Well, Francis, I'm sad to say that our time is up. This has been just so wonderful. I'm glad I caught you in between cooking on the streets of New York. What's the name of the book coming out? It's, I think it's going to be called Fires of Patagonia, and it will come out next year. And it's, it's about uh, the, 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 the fires of Patagonia in different cities of the world. I already did Paris. I'm doing next week. We're doing New York now. We're doing San Francisco, Rome, and... <clears throat> Patagonia as well, and probably um, St. Petersburg in Russia. So you're cooking on the streets with, in those yeah, cities? in those cities, using the products of those cities with, with the language of our cooking. So being inspired by the beautiful products of those cities and those countries, but using our, our way of cooking. So it's not that I come to America and do American cooking. No, I'm doing my cooking with the wonderful products of New York. All right. Well, tell us where your restaurants are. And uh, how do we get in them? <laughs> uh, okay, well, uh, well I, have, I have four restaurants open now. One in Buenos Aires, it's called Patagonia Sur. It's a tiny restaurant of 12 seats. I've had it for 17 years. I have one in Mendoza, which is the wine area of Argentina. I had, it's called 1884, and it's been there for 16 years. I have Garzón, which is this ghost town in Uruguay, where I have a little inn, hotel, and restaurant. Um, and then I have one in Trancoso in Brazil, in the north of Brazil, in the beach, uh, uh, which is, is, you know, it's sort of a fish restaurant. Okay, guys. You know, you're not going to see me here next week. I'm off to Uruguay. It sounds too good. <laughs> Francis, thank you so much. No, thank you. It's very, very nice being here at Roberto's and mm. eating some nice pizza. pizza with you. Thank you. They did the fire right. Yeah, they see did you, it. See you next time. Okay. <laughs> 
thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. Got Stitcher? Heritage Radio Network is on it, so get it. Stitcher is an award-winning provider of news and talk radio for your mobile phone. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.